to the annual general meeting of the Housing Management Board. The first item of business on the agenda is the election of chair. Can I invite nominations for chair, please? I nominate um, Alex Marsh. Sorry, who's that speaking, sorry? It's Councillor Clough speaking. Sorry, I didn't see you, right. Thank you. And a seconder for that, please? Yes, as, as the co-chair of the meeting, can I uh, second that nomination, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other nominations? No, looks like we're okay. So in the absence of any other nominations, I can confirm that Alex Marsh is chair for the Housing Management Board for this year. So Alex, can I hand over to you? Well, thanks very much, Steve. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a long time since we were together face to face and given current circumstance, it feels like a pr practically like a lifetime ago, uh, <laughs> really. Um, so um, just before we, we, we move on to the business, a couple of, I guess, quick announcements. We've already been informed that the meeting is, is streaming live on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, so that's uh, uh, something which is uh, gonna um, change the dynamic a little bit, I think. But and really importantly, in terms of running meetings on Zoom, um, uh, I think we need to be making full use of the um, raise hands functions. So when we move on to discuss later on, uh, please, if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, uh, press the Zoom uh, raise hand button. That works uh, whether or not you've got your video on. I know some members of the, of the uh, board, either because of bandwidth or for other reasons, are going to operate with their cameras off, but you can still operate with the, uh, the raise hand function if you, if you want to uh, contribute. Um, and then the other thing to, to, to um, observe there is just that um, if, you, if you need to, it would be also useful if you, if you need to step out of the meeting also to raise your hand just to let us know that you're, that you're intervening. So for members of the public watching on YouTube, the Housing Management Board has uh, got uh, members who are drawn from uh, the councillors of Bristol City Council and uh, importantly tenant representatives and leaseholder representatives and that is the Housing Management Board along, alongside myself but a number of other people who are here on, uh, in attendance from democratic services from housing within the council will be contributing but the board itself is a combination of the councillors and the uh, tenant and resident representatives and the only other thing to say colleagues is um, if you put your hand up and you wish to intervene or contribute it would be a good idea if you just uh, remember to introduce yourself and which uh, capacity you're here, here in, either as a representative or a, a councillor or an, uh, an officer. So that'd be really helpful just for people who are watching to know uh, who, who's, who's contributing to the meeting. So on that basis, just with those sort of uh, that preamble, we can move on to the business. We can cast our minds back. Oh, actually, we should start, I think, with um, introductions. And I will... Um, attempt to do this in the order people appear on my uh, boxes appear on my screen so in that case um can i start with um pete pete Dorn? uh yes thank you alex um hopefully you can hear me okay uh my name is pete door i'm the co-chair of the housing management board and uh, the tenant representative uh here representing the and i hope julian's going to correct me if i get this wrong 28,000 tenants of Bristol who make up one in six people living in the city. So Julian next. Sorry for that, my microphone is, is kicking on and off. I'll just say that again, in case you missed it. I'm Julian Higson, I'm Director of Housing and Landlord Services at the City Council. Did you get it that time? Thanks. We did, thank you. Thank you. Steve? Hi, my name is Steve Gregory, Democratic Services. I'm Clark in meeting at the board meeting today. Uh, Councillor Goggins next. Hi, Councillor Goggin, um, Harkley from Widderwood. And Councillor Smith. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Smith. I'm a, an observer here today. I'm the cabinet member for housing. Uh, Robert Swift. Yeah, I'm uh, Rob Swift. I'm a senior project manager in housing and landlord services. 
and uh, like Paul, mostly observing, but uh, might contribute to the moving forward together item. Thank you. Uh, Ross Dallimore? Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, Ross Dallimore representing the Leaseholders Forum. Thanks, Ross. Uh, Sarah? Sarah Spicer, Business Innovation Manager in Housing and Landlord Services. Um, uh, Liz Cheatham? Hi, Liz Cheatham, Team Leader, Tenant Participation. Councillor Bolton? Councillor Bolton, Southfield. Southfield, okay. And uh, Councillor Clough? Uh, Councillor Harriet Clough, uh, Lib Dem, representing Hengrove and Whitchurch Park. Councillor Sergeant? Disappeared. No, no sound. Um, Can I just say I'm here? Yes, I was, you're next, Christine. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, no problem. Sorry, uh, like Christine, Kevin. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I couldn't get into the meeting for ages, Zoom, and all of a sudden it's come in. So introduce but, yourself, Christine. Christine Jory, tenant rep of um, Redfield St George. And uh, Kerry? Hello, I'm Kerry Bales. Um, I'm a resident in Hartcliffe and um, tenant rep for Area 6. And uh, uh, people are moving around now, hang on. Uh, uh, Philip? No sound. You're on mute. Uh, that's disappeared. Uh, so go back to uh, Councillor Sergeant, are you uh, back in the room? Sorry, yeah, I'm just having some problems well, with my signal and I've had to move into another room and make and let someone else cook the tea um, to give you my undivided attention. So you missed my introduction. I'm Joe Sargent. I'm councillor for Avonmouth and Lawrence Western. Thank you. I think that's so we're pretty much pretty much there. Um, there are um, so the other thing people are already doing, which I think is really helpful, and we've all learned if we've been using Zoom over the Last little while is muting when we're not um, speaking, and that helps with the uh, keep the connections sort of stable and the and the meeting flowing. So that's really really helpful. So if we uh, move on to a apologies for us, Richard Spencer Eddy has apologised, Susan Houghton has apologised, and to report to the committee that uh, Richard White, who was one of the tenant uh, representatives has uh, stepped down from the committee because he has got other, uh, his other commitments means it's been difficult for him to uh, take on the role, continue with the role that he's had as the representative. Uh, so the, so that, that, that's just a report at this stage. And we've, I've talked to the uh, colleagues supporting the meeting to make sure that messages from this committee get back to, to his area and, and that the process for finding a replacement will get underway in, in due course. But uh, Richard was, isn't able to be, to be with us because of other commitments. So moving on uh, to item three, which is minutes of the previous meeting. For those of us who were there, if we can cast our minds back all the way to uh, 7th of Jan. Uh, can I first ask whether there's anybody who wants to raise uh, anything in relation to accuracy on uh, the first page of the minutes, second page of the minutes, uh, third page of the minutes, fourth page of the minutes. Anybody got anything they want to pick up on there that, that doesn't resonate? If not, we'll have a quick look at the matters arising. So one of the things that um, uh, we've got flagged out there on the second page of the minutes under item five, fire safety updates, uh, we've got um, uh, at the bottom of the first set of bullet points, officers would report back to the board on any further recommendations arising from publication of phase two report. I just don't, I'm not sure where, whether that was something for this meeting or whether we're still waiting for that report or that's going to come to a, a future meeting. Yeah, Alex, um, the, yeah, Julian. The, the report was only published last Monday. So the draft bill um, was only published last Monday. So we are at the moment working through the 322 pages of the bill. Um, I'm not personally. 
um, but there are 320 odd pages of the bill and we're working through them in order to, to find out exactly what they mean, um, what our options are uh, and how we might fulfil the bill when it comes into force. And we will, of course, come back to this meeting. I think it is one that this meeting would want an update on because it will have an impact. Okay. Obviously, okay. we manage our, our, our larger blocks of flats. OK, so, so we, we, we note that to be to be an item for ne next time around. And over the page, we've got a couple of, of um, specific issues. C can we take it that that's so we've got um, officers undertook to look into issues, officers undertook to look to concern about lawnmowers and stairwells. Is that, are, can we um, are we confident that's been taken in hand? I can't answer for that specific case. If, if, if residents, okay. were, it's well, always, obviously we do have a policy about keeping lawnmowers in stairwells, and and and, and we, have, sure. we have a distinct policy as a local authority for people storing either lawnmowers, um, mobility scooters, etc., in 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 stairwell areas. So, and we would try and enforce that usually. Well, okay. So, 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 rather than detain it, detain us today, can I? Um, can we just invite to outside the meeting to just confirm that that was that was. Um, acted upon that would be great and then um item anything else anybody wants to raise in relation to the, the minutes or should we move on uh kerry um yeah just on the um i think it was item three on the fire safety um is that just is the fire safety checks just um carried out on flats or tower blocks or is it all residential um council properties Julian? Um, there are specific requirements for blocks over a certain height. Um, we carry out regular um, fire safety checks anyway, um, but with the new regulations will mean that we have different regime for carrying out checks, more checks, and for, for, high, for larger buildings, we will have to have nominated officers and, and um, we'll have to check every fire door on a regular basis, as well as, as complying with a range of, of um, new measures that are coming in. So at the moment, like I say, 320 odd pages of detail, so I can't go through exactly what it says in each individual case, but fire doors are generally only, are generally only fitted, obviously, on um, blocks in, or requirement only on larger blocks and obviously in corridors. So it is not like house type flats or ordinary um, like things like EPDs and things like that. Is that included? I, the moment, Carrie, I can't answer that. They haven't been in the past. We will, if if there's a change to that, obviously we'll be in touch with with any resident that's affected. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, and Christine, you're on mute, Christine. I keep pressing on mute and it. Oh. You're, you're on. You're okay. We can hear you. Oh, you can. Sorry. I keep pressing yeah. it and it, nothing happens. It's, it's, there's a little bit of a lag in it, Christine. Oh, so if yeah. you press it once and then give it a moment to see if it unmutes before pressing it again, because otherwise you, oh, right. yeah. you're, okay. you're basically muting oh. and unmuting yourself Thank repeatedly. Well, we get... oh, thanks for the help. Yeah. Um, if you can still hear me, if the. Yes. If the lawnmower issue was relating to my block, the person concerned has palled up and is parking it in someone who lives in one of the bungalows on site instead of the stairwell. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. So we'll. we'll so things things may well have moved moved on, but we'll we'll keep yeah. hold of that for and just to confirm what's where where we are next time around. Anybody else wish to contribute in relation to our business from last time? If not, we'll, we'll move on to item five, which is re report back from the Bristol Homes Board. Is a verbal update for this one. And, and Pete, was that? Uh, so chair, it's a public uh, forum item. question. Sorry, Chair, the public forum question answer to be noted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, you're right. Absolutely right. So I, I, um, I 
item four, public forum question. We had a uh, we had a question submitted for our miles, and a, a um, an answer has been provided by the officers of the city council, uh, um, and that's been returned to the to the board, but also to the to the questioner. My understanding is that Ryan's not here at the meeting to ask a supplementary. Um, in which case, I think that's for noting at this stage. That's correct, Joe. He said he would try to get here, but he, he, it sounded like he wouldn't be able to. So yeah, in his absence, yes, you're just required to know and make any comment if you so wish. Okay. i just check if any members of the board wanted to um, follow up on anything that was was part of that answer. Christine, you've, you've I've got your hand up and I've got... Oh, sorry, so I didn't Christine come to first it. and then Pete. Oh, sorry, no worries. Okay, Pete. <laughs> Um, thank you, Alex. Um, I, I was just going to note um, that Ryan is a member of staff at the, um, let's try and get this right, I think it's Courtfield Road, the, the uh, family accommodation that the city runs with uh, one of the has, housing providers. Um, uh, and uh, he, his question is actually very, very important because um, I, I am aware that here in Bristol Northwest, we have a particular Eastfield estate, which was one of the last the city built, uh, and uh, the, the house builder went bankrupt. So the city rescued the building and completed the construction, uh, but that it, it is known to be a, a very low standard of noise transfer. And Ryan actually lives in one of the properties affected by that. So we, we have a situation, just to make Julian aware, where there are a number of properties, around 100 to 300 properties, that have appalling noise transfer problems, where unless there are fire closures fitted on the doors that, that release and close the doors in a certain time, the doors slam and reverberate and, and make the neighbours' lives very, very, very difficult. Um, so I'm aware of the problem that Brian is describing because of having lived in the area that he's uh, drawing our attention to. And, and I would encourage Alison Scott uh, and the team to pay particular attention um, because we actually owe Ryan a, d a duty of gratitude for the fact that he, he does such tireless work for us uh, in one of the uh, city's own properties over in Fortfield Road. So I just want to observe that and thank him on behalf of the committee. Thanks, Pete. That's, that's a helpful uh, gloss on the detail there. Um, but also, before we, move, before we move on to the next slide, I'd just like to um, remind people, particularly if there's people um, watching this uh, uh, board meeting uh, on YouTube, that, that is, it is uh, open to anyone to submit a question uh, uh, if they want to the, the procedure for doing that is to email into it's into democratic services at the city council uh, sufficiently in advance of the meeting uh, which is I think th th three days be uh, considered so is this isn't a board that takes contributions from from the floor even when we're meeting in public but it's one where we're very happy to uh, take questions uh, being submitted uh, to the council through that procedure. So please do it if there's something about housing in the local property uh, area that is, is, is of pressing interest to you. So that being said, um, shall we move up? Pete, you got your hand up, is that uh, in, at that point? Sorry, that was- I'm handing over to you anyway, so I was, move, moving along. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's moving on to the Bristol Homes Board and I'll <clears> hand over to you anyway at this point. So please do. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, the Bristol Homes and Communities Board met virtually, and I think we're the first of the one city boards to meet using Zoom on the 25th of June. And uh, the minutes and the papers are all on the website at, um, I think it's democracy.bristol.gov.uk from memory. But if you search for Bristol Homes and Communities Board, you'll see all the papers. Um, the, the topic was very much themed around sustainability. Um, we began with presentations by Asia Stewart and Hannah uh, Spungen on the Bristol Fuel Poverty Action Plan, uh, and the PDF of that is available with the minutes. Um, we also discussed uh, 
the One City Climate Strategy um, and had a, a really good presentation by Ian Barrett of the Urban Wildlife Trust. Um, and uh, the, there were a number of um, themed questions that arose from that around the ecological emergency. Um, the papers, as I say, that the PDFs of the documents for those are all available on the uh, website of the Bristol Homes and Communities Board on bristol.gov.uk. Um, and the next meeting of the board will take place on the 8th of October. Is that okay? Thanks, that, JP. Any, anybody? No, that's great. Thank you. It's very helpful. Um, colleagues, anything you want to pick up on there or, or, or ask about on the back of that? No? Thank you. Well, that's great. Thanks for that. It's really, really helpful. So we'll now move on to item six, which is um, land, uh, Housing and Landlord Services COVID-19 update. And I believe, Julian, you're going to take this item. Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, would it be appropriate if I could share my screen to do so? Um, it would be appropriate if you can do it. That's the thing. I know I always manage to mess that up, but please have a go. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see what I can... Uh, see if I can find that. There we go. So I'm hoping people can see that. If somebody could nod or say so, that's marvellous. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. So we just wanted to do an update of, of what happened essentially through as a result of COVID-19 and how we, we were delivering services and any changes um, and how we, how we managed to cope. Um, we've covered the period from April and May because those are the full months that we had the data available for at the time and comparative data from, from other areas. Um, so the highlights, as you can see there, is, is we had a really good um, response from, from members of staff. 91% um, of people were available to work. Um, and people have been really flexible about where they worked and what they did. So, for instance, you know, we had, we had our carpentry team. We're making the, um, the new COVID secure booths for, for the customer service centre. We had people clearing up sites. We had people who were helping to put together the, the temporary resting place at Sandy Park. Um, people volunteering to get in touch with people um, and do calls to people. So we, we really had, I thought, a tremendous response from, from the team who not just went and did their own jobs, but were out and about in the city doing anything that needed to be doing. Um, we made nearly 7,500 calls to our most vulnerable residents um just essentially to check if they're okay if they needed anything if we could refer them on to any further help or just to, to have a chat in some cases um the feedback from that was really really positive um loads of people just saying how great it was that we got in we wanted we we're going to get in touch with people um so i think that was that was really good um we responded to 607 ASB nuisance and hate crimes, including response. But obviously, we had quite a few few um, complaints of, of noise nuisance and breaches of social distancing measures. The majority of those cases, I think, you know, we were able to sort out amicably and mutually, um, just by reminding people of, of their obligations and and you know what the guidance was. Um, we did respond to a number of reports of domestic abuse. One of the things I have to say is that as we managed to continue to let properties throughout um, COVID-19 on an emergency basis, we were able to rehouse people who were victims of domestic abuse um, in some of those. Gas safety certificate, every landlord around the country has, has suffered, obviously, with people not wanting to let people in to do gas safety inspections. Um, and but we managed to still, we're at a 96% um, access at the moment, a 96% with current gas, gas certificates, which is significantly higher than the national average at the moment. One of the reasons for that is, is we had a suggestion that came from the gas servicing team themselves in terms of contacting residents in advance, ringing them first, 
um, discussing everything with them. And that's been, that's proved absolute dividends in terms of getting into properties. We've actually managed to get into a higher proportion of properties than, than we do usually. So that's a really good example of, of, of our officers taking some initiative and, and doing that. We managed to complete 3,131 and a half, no, just 2,131 emergency repairs during the period. Um, we've also caught up with 2,519 um, non-urgent repairs and that, that built up over that period. So we've now completed the vast majority of those repairs and we're back to a normal repair service as of last week, I think, or this week. Um, which is, is cool. 107 homes were repaired and relet um, through direct offers. One of the things that found really difficult for people to move was that shops weren't open to buy furniture, to get hold of stuff that you need. Um, we started a little cottage industry um, throughout lockdown of recycling stuff we found in some properties, um, testing it, upcycling it and, and making sure it got to people who needed it. So we had as well our voids teams were not only repairing properties, they were ferrying stuff around from place to place so that people could actually move in, which I think was again, just absolutely terrific. Um, obviously we've got a lot more households in temporary and emergency accommodation than we had at the start. We, we've put more than 400 individuals into hotels and other similar accommodation and got them off the streets. Um, which we managed to do in a really short short period of time. There's still about 250 people who still need to be found homes for who are still in the hotels and, and the, host, the youth hostel and the YMCA. Um, we've already found settled accommodation for, for those that, um, for some of the people that need it. Our goal still with this is that nobody's going to go back on the streets who we put in accommodation unless it's their choice. Um, and we're well on the way to doing that. Um, we established two temporary sites for vehicle dwellers um, across the city, working with Vehicles for Change. We're the only English council to do that. We've had some very positive press for it. Uh, that's worked really well. Um, 542 people had home adaptations or tech enabled care. And again, that was helping people to be safely discharged from hospital and all remain at home during the pandemic. Um, and we, we, again, provided support to other council services um, throughout um, the period of the pandemic. I mean, one of the things is we tried to, to maintain as much of a, a channels of communication with residents as possible. We tried to, to try and reiterate the guidance and try and continue to provide services as much as possible. It was, I have to say, for all of us involved. I'm sure our residents found it remarkably difficult that period, but for those of us involved, especially the first few weeks, it was some of the most difficult weeks we've ever experienced in terms of our working lives, I think. Um, from, from, from talking to, my, to colleagues and knowing from my own experience, there were some really difficult times for us, but I'm really pleased with the way we've managed to, we managed to pull together, not just our own housing services, but with colleagues across the city, support agencies, drug and alcohol agencies, other bits of the council with, um, with the police, um, et cetera. So it's been, I think it's been a tremendous joint effort. I won't say we've got everything right and there'll probably be things we can learn from it and we want to learn from it. But overall, I think we, we, we did as well as we could have done. Thanks for that overview, Julian. Colleagues, comments, questions? Uh, so I've got uh, Charlie, then Paul Smith, then Philip, I think it was. Ch so Ch Charlie Bolton first. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't know. I, I thought you said you did X emergency repairs or repairs and you'd caught up. Is, is that right? I mean, it, it, I suppose my question is, has, has COVID resulted in a big backlog or a backlog to various or any services? Um. I mean, it's always going to result in a backlog. I mean, what we had, um, we continued to, to do all emergency repairs throughout. So we didn't do, we, we did any emergency repair that was a, that, uh, uh, that needed doing. We then built up a backlog of about 2,500 non-essential repairs, which we have been working through over the last five or six weeks. 
and have now pretty much completed. We are now taking all repairs again. Um, so people can just repair, report repairs in the normal manner and expect to get them done within the normal timescale. What we will do is we will still ring people before we go and check that they want the repair carried out, check that they're aware of our um, safeguarding and socially distancing measures um, and whether in that they're happy to comply with those. And if they are, we, we go around and do it. There's been a delay to some planned maintenance programmes, as you would expect, um, primarily because either one, we had those are contracted out to contractors who weren't working um, during lockdown. Most of those are now back working again. And in some cases, we chose to stop any planned maintenance that was too invasive within the blocks. Um, because again, we felt that wouldn't have been appropriate and could be restarted again later. Um, but everything else has been restarted. The one new housing development we have on site at Ashton Rise um, was continued to be worked on by um, the constructors, Wilmot Dixon, throughout the pandemic, but with a smaller workforce on site. Okay. My, my allotment... Ooh. My, my allotment over, overlooks that, so... I saw them. Anyway, I guess I better mute and get get the smoke detector off. <laughs> okay, thanks, Charlie. Um, so I think I've got Philip, then Pete, then Councillor Sergeant. I think. Yeah, I'd just like to thank um, the repairs team from uh, where I live in Mordry House. It's a supported housing for older people, and the repairs team came out twice. Uh, one for an elderly lady whose bathroom light had gone and she couldn't climb a step and and uh, get the bulb out and they came they came the next day and did it and one was a plumbing job and i think they did an excellent job during the cor coronavirus um, epidemic so i'd like to praise them and that's a rarity but um, thank you very much Ms. Dixon. thank you Thank you, Philip. It's great to get feedback. Thank you, Philip. Um, Pete? I, I guess I'm, I'm going to pick up on what Philip was saying there and also extend my thanks um, because I'm hearing positive things about repairs, emergency repairs going on uh, throughout lockdown. In, in my own case, even the 10-year electrical um, check was done and uh, it was <clears throat> done to the incredibly wonderful standard of, you know, ringing in advance, checking everything was okay before coming, and, and the standards of customer care that are being set by the repairs and, and the maintenance service is phenomenally high. And I, I just want to go on record as saying that, um, because as you say, Julian, we're, <clears throat> we're very quick to criticise, but we're not always as quick to give thanks and recognition. And it, it is with extreme gratitude that I express my thanks for a most excellent 10-year electrical safety check, which was done with incredibly high standards of customer care and phone calls in advance and preparation, which made it a much more easy job. The only figure I'd like to pick up on there in, in what you've read out was, I think it was the 541 from memory adaptations. I'm hearing anecdotally, and I know through my own experience of waiting just under a year for the Accessible Homes team to conduct an assessment, let alone to carry out any actions from it, that there is a backlog. There is a very big backlog, not for the people who are leaving hospital in need of adaptations, but from the people who are currently in their homes. And I do worry about how long it is taking. Um, people are typically promised three months when they enter that service. They have an expectation that they're going to be assessed within three months they're waiting anything up to a year. And, and the impression I'm getting is that there are more silos than NORAD in social services. There are I'm... teams past, it's just, a, it's just very, very disappointing to have to express that. So I'm going to have to go on record as doing so. So Pete, thank you. I have a, I am I... taking that one up with Hugh Evans about the DFGs and the adaptions. That is a problem. They are aware of it. Um, I don't suppose if you've got any specific examples you'd care to share with me, if you'd be willing to, so I can add it to the pile that I'm taking to him. 
Uh, yes, if you'd like to put your email in the minutes of the meeting, I can probably do that. That would be great. Yep. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, can I? Okay. Just, That's great. Sounds like something important. Can I just come back online? Julian, yes. I just want to come back. I want to, I want to thank thank Pete for the for the kind comments. Um, one of the things, obviously, I, I do expect and want people to, to criticise us if we get it wrong, because we should be, and that's how we learn and, and we get things right. Um, I think it has been great, but not just not just from people here, but, you know, people have been really, across the city, have been really good at telling us how well we've come, coped during, during the pandemic, and we've had a lot of positive feedback. So I think people have, you know, have been really good in sharing that. I think on DFGs, I mean, obviously, we, the, the private sector housing team carries out the DFG work. Um, so I can't, I can't necessarily answer for the assessments, but I do know that one of the problems we do have is um, a delay in contractors carrying out the work. And we do have problems finding contractors who are willing to carry out the work and get onto our framework. So that's something we're constantly trying to address. Okay, thanks for that. So, um, uh, Councillor Sergeant, you've, been, you've had your hand up for a little while, so want to come in here? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to actually make a um, proposal of um, thanking the um, Julian's teams for all the work that they've done throughout um, this difficult time. I think the fact that you've got a 91% worker um, people of people in work is pretty impressive um, and um, you know I'm sure not everything's gone smooth we've all been perfect but I think they rec recognize the human effort that, that that has sort of happened during this time I know there's a lot of challenges but on the other so I'd like to sort of make that as a proposal and hope that someone would second me and that we would actually formally thank the team for that but also um, seconded Joe. thanks Harriet just a question um, really about takeaways from the experience that you've had, because obviously you've been up against some unprecedented challenges and it sounds like some of those challenges have been met really well. And I just wonder, and this may not be a question for you to answer now, perhaps it's something that you could come back to us with, is what's, what do you think that you've learned from the experience of dealing with, you know, um, uh, Bristol City Council's estate um, and tenants during uh, a pandemic that you might be able to use to improve the service for not just during the really difficult times, but during the normal times, you know, all the things that people moan about. Do you think you've found any solutions to problems? I'm not saying you've solved it all, but how, do you think by having to work differently, you might have come across some different ways that might actually solve a few problems so I just kind of think that would be useful to get a bit of um you know a bit of feedback on that even if you're not able to give it now uh, thank thanks Joe I mean I think we are we have obviously we do think about these things and um, we're thinking about them actively for two, a couple of reasons one obviously we need to two there may well be a second wave at some point and therefore we need to be prepared and make sure we 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 get as much right as we can in preparation for that or, or when that happens um I think the things that I think have been positive about the way we've reacted is I think it's forced us to do some stuff we've been wanting to try and do for some time and, and, and have found it difficult for, for a number of reasons. Um, one of which is making much more fit, much more contact and talking to residents directly and not relying on things like emails and text, etc. Um, and standard operating procedures. So contacting residents directly through through the calls we made. Um, people having to work from home and go out on site a lot rather than come into the office every day. I mean, that, that's been really bad for some people, but it's in some respects, it's helped us to be more flexible in terms of how we get across the city. And I think the third thing has been in actually um, how we deal with our income management and people who, who find it difficult to pay the rent. Um, We've stopped just sending them letter one, then letter two, then letter three, then a notice of seeking possession and following this big chain of activity. We've done, we've, we've been able to move the service quicker to where we wanted to be, which is a position of actually dealing with people as individuals, talking to them about their personal circumstances and trying to sort out a solution that suits them in terms of trying to maximize their income, maximize the ways that they might be able to pay and do that. And I think that's been, that's been something I would never want us to go back and change that back now. 
thanks Julian for that. I've got I've got three people. I think I've got Christine, I've got Kerry, and I've got Philip. So Christine. You might be on mute again. No, I'm not. That's it. No, you are. Good. No, I'm Fine. not. Uh, sorry, it's getting to grip. Um, regarding making contact with tenants, as um, someone in sheltered housing, um, you've stopped doing face-to-face -face visits. Coupled with that, um, certain a a um, housing support officers have gone off sick. So we in sheltered housing are getting a very brief, are you okay, on the intercom twice a week, um, you know, to a stranger. Now, if someone, a stranger sort of contacts me, I don't know who it is, I'm naturally not going to say anything about my problems. The phone calls you were giving to your vulnerable tenants, I appreciate you can't phone everyone in the first week, but mine didn't come through till June. Are you okay for food and your prescriptions? Well, since I've been locked in since the end of March, that's rather a long time if I hadn't been. Yeah, I can come back on that, Alex. Yeah. I mean, I do apologize yeah. that we've not we've not been able to restart um, personal visits yet, Christine. We are planning to do so as soon as we can at the moment. Um, uh, I'm not expecting it. I was still, just still saying working. that because a member has gone off sick, or at least one, you know, they are very understaffed and very rushed. They are a team. They are a team that you know, obviously, with a lot of um, caring type roles like that, that do suffer from from large amounts of sickness absence at the moment, and obviously difficult to recruit to. Yeah, uh, we are trying to. We are. We have had difficulties recruiting to to the, to the mobile warden post. We're still continually recruiting. Um, in terms of the phone call, we did try and prioritise, obviously, those people that we felt were most vulnerable. So those people that were over over kind of 75 and, and shielding, we tried to get to first. Obviously, the council already had a list of those people that were um, that were officially shielding that was provided by the government. And another part of the council, which was the, the Week and Bristol team, obviously, were, were past getting around to those people as soon as possible first. So we felt we would not deal with those people. They were already being contacted with the council. We would prioritise the people who weren't in those categories. Um, but obviously, yeah, it did take some weeks to get around to 7,500 calls. Oh, I appreciate that. But in my case, I was due to go for a hospital appointment. They said, oh, I'll ring you next week to ask the additional questions. And there were no additional questions. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry if we didn't get to you. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not complaining. I'm. I'm able to have shouted for help if I'd needed it. Thanks, Christine. Well, that wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, Kerry, did you want to come in at that point? Um, I think Julian's already answered my uh, question. It was on um, rent arrears and evictions, and obviously, um, a lot of people are not working or lost their jobs or. Um, or now claiming benefits that weren't. So I just, I was just wondering what was happening, but I think you already answered it. I mean, I can go a little bit further, Kerry, which is we've managed to secure some a significant amount more of discretionary housing payment money that was that was given as uh, part of the government package. That so we've secured it for housing. Some of it was going to council tax re um, reduction, but. We've managed to get that. We've been working quite successfully with a lot of residents at the moment to make additional payments where people have found themselves with no money um, suddenly or a long wait to access any money. And we've been actively trying to target um, those people and, and help them out with discretionary payments so that they don't either fall in arrears, but importantly, so that, you know, they're not having to, find, they're not having to find money that they need to live on and to pay their rent. That, that's that's brilliant to hear. So I know as a council tenant myself, uh, myself and someone who claims benefits, I worry and it can be um, discretionary payments means that you might not necessarily have to go and use a food bank. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really great to hear. Thank you. So I've got I think I've got Philip next and I've got and then Councillor Clough again. So Philip. Thank you. All. <laughs> all I'd like to go back a bit, if I can, into these adaptions. Um, without naming names, I have, I have a walk-in shower and I'm in a shop, sheltered housing, all the people because of my stroke. 
And one of my neighbours, who's in her late 80s, comes over now with her niece three times a week to have a shower in my shower because she has a bath and she can't get in a bath. And she's been waiting over, she tells me, she's been waiting over two years to have a shower put on. Well, I, I would press that supportive housing for older people units should all have walk-in showers because we're all here because of a medical condition or age. And as it's an, old, an aging population, why is the council putting walk-in showers in places like where I used to live in Corbett House when there's no need for them? They can move into a, a purpose-built accommodation because I know where they've taken showers out and put a bath back in. Well, that's surely a waste of a resource. And that all these places, such as Maudley House, St. Catherine's Court, should all have walk-in showers. The other thing I'd like Julian, to... Julian, come back along. Just going on... Sorry, to, Carol. Just going on about rent arrears. I had a lady come to me asking me to help her because I've got a bit of a reputation of helping people if I can. And she owes £4,800 in rent. And it's been wiped out. She got a letter saying that they will forget it. Well, hang on a minute. What's going on here? £4,800 over 10 years. And she, the council's just wiping it out. I don't agree with that at all. And I, she got short shift from my tongue. So anyway, that's the end of the comment. Thank you very much for your time. Julian, do you like to respond? Thanks, Philip. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with, with I take your point about walking showers. I mean, I think one of the issues we've got is is that, you know, obviously the sheltered housing blocks were built some some time ago and not all of them are, you know, I think probably we need to look at what we do with them collectively in terms of modernising them over the next over the next few years. And that that's a piece of work that we were hoping to start this year in terms of looking at that and mapping out, you know, what that what that piece of work might look like. Unfortunately, we've had to delay it slightly because we can't really get out and about and look at them. Uh, but we will be doing that. I do take the point about you know walking showers in in other non uh, non special. <laughs> but I mean, I think we have to work with individual individual residents and, and families. Um, ideally. The idea of, of adaptations is so that people can remain independent and stay in the home they wish to stay in for as long as possible. If they wish to move, obviously we will we'll help them. We can encourage them. We can we can put them in touch with the, with with um, the right bits of uh, of the service through through our lettings team or through their housing officer. But you know, a lot of the adaptations are there so that people can remain where they are and can continue to live there. So. Um, and so that's why we do them, but it isn't, it is an issue. In terms of the rent, I am, there are some cases obviously, um, and I don't know this case, um, and, I don't, and I wouldn't want to comment on an individual case anyway, but there will be some cases where we will, you know, make discretionary housing payments to people who are finding it difficult. If on the extreme that we're obviously, that we would go to the extreme of that amount of money, then there would be a significant story behind that um, that we would need, we would have looked into and would need to look into. Um, and so without knowing the story behind that, I can't comment on whether that happened or what the case was or why it was, but I do know that what we are doing on a, you know, on a daily basis at the moment is making a significant amount of discretionary housing payments, which just are allowing people not to build up rent arrears or as we said, as, or as I said, just to to make sure that you know they they are helped to be able to pay their rent, so that you know they they're not having to use money that's that's there for essential living. Okay, thanks, Julian. Uh, Councillor Clough, did you want to come in at that point? You're um, hang on, you. There we go. I should have unmuted now. Yeah. yeah. Mine have been predominantly coming in on the comment to Pete about the DFG thing. It is a problem above and beyond with council tenants. Um, it may be worth the housing management board 
commenting in the minutes or something that they would like to see an improvement or a report on this so that they know what's going on because even when I've asked social services adult social care directly as somebody waiting for a DFG there is an established problem with getting adaptions done I'm 16 months into a wait for adaptions to a housing association one and that's post the OT confirming I need it so it's I, I suspect it's only tangentially something that the housing management board can comment on about recommendations but people might find a report interesting well I'm seeing a number of people nodding in response to that so um can we can we note that and say actually I think that it would be given that it's, that it's been raised or surrounding issues have been raised a couple of times there that feels like something which might be worth looking into a little bit bit further sorry i'm happy for us to coordinate something either a written response to the to report to, to to members of the board or to to put it on as an agenda item next time if that's what people want and i'll i'll coordinate the different bits of the council get um, to, to, to do that That'd be helpful. I mean, I think I think um, uh, certainly yeah, let's have it as let's have it as an agenda item. But perhaps um, s s see what a, a report would, um, would would deliver to us, and maybe we'll, we'll have a we'll have a report and then take questions on it or something like that. Maybe rather than asking anybody necessarily to do a to do a presentation. I mean, the only other thing I was going to mention on this item before we move on, um, Julian, was that, that one of the things that struck me was your. Um, comments about sort of recycling and upcycling on non te tenancy transitions because it just reminded me I mean that's one of these uh, areas which has come out quite strongly in research on sort of precarity and precarious living the idea that the setting up a tenancy and um, almost the cost of doing so and, and putting put almost setting people up to fail in the sense that by the time they've got those various essentials to, to actually be able to live in the property they're, they're, they, they've had to go to uh, sort of uh, borrow money at extraordinary rates of interest or whatever it might be so that seemed to me something which you know, absolutely makes sense in the pandemic, but it's one of those areas where you know that that might well be something that that, that has a has a longer sort of shelf life as, a, as an activity that can really facilitate getting people up and sort of set up on their own, standing on their own two feet. Well, great minds think alike, Alex. That's one that I've already um that's one that I've already set in train. So I've got a project team up and running to see how we can make that a reality on on a much larger scale in the future. Hopefully, we're working... Julian. Yeah. There are a number of charities that will help with white and brown goods for a whole variety of groups. With my Armed Forces Covenant hat on, the RBL and SAFA will both do that for anybody with a vague military connection. I know that there are a number of other charities who will do similar things, but I can't name them off the top of my head. So it's worth looking for who those are in Bristol. Thank you. If Thank you, you need contact with the RBL or SAFA for reference for you, I can send those to you. Uh, brilliant thank you i mean we are one of the things we're doing at the moment is working with with bristol waste um on on enhancing the scheme that they've got at the moment and again we get we we get you know a lot of white goods that that we that get left in people's properties and so we want to rather than rather than chuck them in a skip and things like that we want to use them again and we've got we've got electricians as well so what's not to like about about making this work but thank you I mean, yeah i mean we'll try and make contact with anyone who can help us that'd be great yeah, because it's a relatively small Thank requirement you. for those two to help. That's great. Thank you for that. So uh, at this that point, perhaps we should move on to item seven, which is moving forward together. And we this has come to the board uh, at a number of previous stages as the project has developed. But we're now getting to the point where there's some concrete uh, outcomes or outputs from that. And Julian, would you like to take us through the, the, the report? Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I will do. And once again, I'm going to try and share it. Um, so, yeah, um, not going to go through the whole history of moving forward together because we, we have talked about it before. Um, but just to, to very quickly recap through this 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 pack, which is hopefully, I mean, we would value your comments on this presentation because it's one that will form the basis of um, the start of our co-design and engagement with with residents more widely. So um, that would be any comments would be great. We'd be grateful for. 
And we set out moving forward together. The idea is that we wanted to become a world-class housing and landlord service. Um, we started out with some events with, with, our own, with our own colleagues about what our values and behaviours should be and, and what it should matter and feel like um, to deliver our services and to work, to work here. Um, we then had the resident survey that we did last year where we got you know, an overwhelming 3,300 responses, um, which led to the six priorities, which you have obviously at the board seen before, of being local, visible, of listening properly to people, It'd be much easier to contact us, keeping our promises, tackling crime, antisocial behaviour and improving the security and appearance of our homes. So those were the th six things that we want to make sure at the heart of whatever we do in terms of our new service delivery. Um, so in order to make those a reality, we wanted a process that would design services from, from residents' point of view, rather than from our point of view. We wanted to make sure that we are visible and local because that's the feedback we had. We feel that we need to rebuild trust and relationships between ourselves, but especially between ourselves and our residents. I think because of the way we've been delivering services, some of that trust has, has maybe disappeared in recent years. Um, Bristol's a diverse, diverse and inclusive place, and we need to make sure that we reflect that both in terms of the way we deliver services and that the, the employee um, base that we have. We want to engage creatively and meaningfully. Um, you know, this is a new way of doing things. Everything's been new. We want to try and make sure we do stuff as, in as modern a way as possible, as well as doing things the ways in that, the traditional methods. And above all, we want to design a service that gives back accountability and decision making locally to residents and locally to employees to do what's best for people living in our particular blocks, estates and homes. So those were the, the guiding principles to make those six priorities happen. So we've always said we wanted to co-design this. So we asked for volunteers. We got more than 50 volunteers from across our own service area out of our thousand and so staff who formed a co-design group. And those 20 people on the co-design and the 30 people from, from, were from all levels of, of, of housing and landlord services, they're from different bits of the service, from repairs, from Sarah's um, business um, innovation team, from housing management, from all, everywhere, and caretaking, and we put them together with our change consultants. Um, they did a whole range. I mean, there were no no senior managers were taking part in this. This was we left it to them um, to look at all to go through a series of virtual workshops to look at all those those things that are on the, on the page there, and to take those design principles and those six outcomes and turn them into what might be a high level model of how we might deliver services in the future. That kind of vision for the service um, and what we've come up with or what they've come up with because um, at the moment is now they've come up with that draft if you like an emerging high level model it is not complete there will be more design to be done there'll be more engagement to be done there'll be more work with residents to be done but what the initial model looks like is that we will have locally based teams they may not be based in offices, but they will be local on our blocks and our estates and they'll be able to operate locally through whatever technology we use and how we enable them to do that. We will try and get to a point where those teams are known to the local community and they can build positive relationships and be part of the, the local community um, and be able to therefore provide services that meet, that aren't just citywide, but meet the specific needs of people locally. We've been doing some of that recently in some blocks. So we've done a couple of kind of low pilots um, because of some specific issues we had in a couple of blocks in Barton Hill, which have been working really well, where we've, we've been working with the residents to address what, what they've been telling us about what's needed in their particular block. So we've started to look at how that might work effectively. Part of that is listening. One of the things that I had residents said to me once was, is you listen to us and you take it all away, but you don't hear it and you don't hear what we're actually living through. And I think that struck me that that's something that needs to change and that we need to do that both at a citywide and a local level. So it's not listening, it's as well as listening, we need to listen and we need to hear and engage. 
in terms of making it easy, we would expect um, under the new model that the, the local housing officer will be named housing officer. You will be able to contact them as a resident. Um, they will be surrounded by a local team of people. So maybe that's caretaking site staff, a repair surveyor, supervisors, et cetera, who will be able to, again, be operating locally. But you will also be able to contact us in any way that you want to, um, whether that be anything from phone, social media, digital, um, in person, whatever. And we will make sure that that can be answered there and then and that whoever you talk to will have your full history know about your case, know about you, what was happening with you and your tenancy and be able to sort that out so that we're not getting these issues whereby someone says they're going to have to talk to someone else. It's not me that deals with that. I didn't do that. Well, I can sort that bit out, but not that bit. That's got to stop. Part of that, obviously, if we can get down that route and get to that point, then we will be able to keep our promises, I think. You know, you've got to, you'll have, people will have a named housing officer and a named officer and no people, they will be responsible. People won't be able to kind of hide behind, it's not my job. Um, what we need to do is to make sure that those people are empowered, they've got the tools, they've got the ability to be able to do that, and that's important. Uh, we will obviously make sure that we collect the best quality performance information and satisfaction information and feedback to make sure that we just continually learn um, from what we do. Clearly, the message from residents is we need to do more about crime and antisocial behaviour. Obviously, that's come from not just from residents in this forum, but residents in all forums and all meetings that we have. Uh, and obviously, day to day feedback. So we do need to reorganise the way we, we deal with antisocial behaviour. We do need to make sure that you're not passed around with people, uh, with people dealing with antisocial behaviour, that someone will manage that and it'll, ideally that should be your housing officer supported by a great sort of backroom set of staff um, and we'll do much we'll, we'll be able to do much more and work jointly with more agencies to do some of the things that are really working i mean today for instance we got two closure orders by working with the police on a couple of blocks um, from two flats that were being used for cuckooing um, and we continually get we're getting more and more of those but obviously it's still a massive issue and it still needs more work. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that not only the security of the estates is better, but the appearance of the estates. So we are looking at different ways we can make physical improvements to, to, to blocks and to estates and to homes. But we also want to set a standard for them to say that this is the standard to which our, our homes and estates should be maintained, our common parts, our, the estate environment. And we don't want them to fall below that. And again, those local teams will be responsible for working with residents to monitor that and make sure that that, that 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 becomes a reality. So that's how we're going to address those six priorities um, with new kind of locally based teams um, who will be, uh, will be empowered and supported to, to be able to deliver those amazing services. So what we're doing now, that vision, that high level vision now needs to be translated into something we can actually implement. It's unlikely, I think, we'll be able to implement it in one big bang kind of approach. So I think we'll need to try out bits in certain areas probably first and refine it. Um, we might not get it all right first time round. I think, you know, it would be it would be foolish to say a big change like this. We might get everything right. So we need to be able to adapt very quickly uh, on feedback. We're going out to as many residents as we can. Um, in terms of engagement over the coming weeks. We use a creative mix of communication and virtual workshops. The virtual workshops that we did throughout lockdown with, with the design team were amazing. We managed to do proper kind of workshops with whiteboards and post-its and stuff with 30 people in different rooms. Um, it's amazing what IT is out there. Um, and again, like I say, we'd appreciate the help of this board, both in terms of suggesting how we can get out to residents how you can help us get out to residents and also, you know, how we're helping us to refine the message that I've, I've just gone through today. So it is, I think, a really um, bit of exciting bit of progress. I've been really excited by the way that the, the co-design team has, has, has got together and done this and the model that they're coming out with. I think it has the potential to really transform the way we deliver services to improve 
to for us to get it right more often and for you know to improve satisfaction of residents across the piece no matter what issues they're facing so i think it's got potential but it's there's a long long way to go uh, and we still need to get over the next few months to something that we can actually roll out and implement that's me Thanks, Julian. So um, I've got, um, Kerry's got a hand up, so Kerry, and then Councillor Sergeant. Kerry? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm really looking forward to this being rolled out. I've been a council uh, tenant um, for coming up to 20 years now, and I can honestly say it's not always been easy um, engaging with the council, um, especially since the rent offices were closed. Um, trying to get to um, Temple Street is really difficult at the best of times and especially um, during lockdown or if, if we go into another lockdown I can't imagine what it'd be like trying to get to Temple Street um, it really feels like um, that we're, we're we're important again we're the tenants um, it's it's from the ground up and that's how it should be we we maintain our houses we paint we decorate them we keep them nice um, we, we all do our best to pay our rent and, you know, and that, that's how it should be. We should be the focus of, of our, of the um, council housing. So I'm really looking forward to this. It, I'm, well, you can't see me because my video is not on, but this all sounds really amazing. Right. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you for that, Kerry. I think it was um, Councillor Sergeant next, then Councillor Clough. Yeah, just um, interesting. I noticed Kat, um, Harriet put a comment in about the issue around people going off sick. And certainly uh, my experience in the past has been that um, there have been a lot of um, there's been a lot of long term sickness and therefore a named housing officer might pose a bit of a challenge, especially with some um, parts of the estate. But um, I, so I suppose the question is really how are we going to kind of like encourage and support the housing team so that they feel that their job isn't so stressful that they're putting them to a position where they need to take time off um, and also and I try not to sound negative about what's gone on in the past I mean I I, I think you've in, you inherited a bit of a mess Julian it has to be said I don't know who's responsible for that mess but what concerned concerns me is that decisions that were made in the past like closing housing offices like seemingly making it harder for tenants to make contact with housing team um, about various issues making the whole thing very impersonal those decisions might have been made because it, it, it seemed like it would be a cheaper way to run the service. I've gone mm. I've been like, a I better think we've Oh dear, yeah, no, I'm having endless problems with my signal. I don't know how far I got before I froze. Does anybody, I don't know. Yeah, um, got, I just want to, go on. Yeah, you got to the bit where you were just saying in terms of you don't know how, who designed the previous service. Yeah. Whether it cost, yeah. But, probably, yeah, it was probably them that cut me off, wasn't it? No, um, it was just that it would seem to be, it seemed, the main purpose of it seemed to be to reduce costs. So what I'm worried about is we don't have any more money. You know, if anything, we've probably got even less than we had when, costs were reduced you know when these savings or these efficiencies were made now i can appreciate there might be an argument that perhaps they weren't as efficient as people thought they were and therefore there might be ways that you can improve the service without it costing any more but it would be interesting to know how you're going to go about supporting the staff first of all so that we can keep you know as much as possible keep our named housing officers and um also how um how you're going to make these really what sound like really positive improvements without um it costing a lot of money there's obviously if you've got some tricks up your sleeve julian and maybe some of them are trademark secrets i don't know but if you know it would be good for us to know how sustainable this will be okay. um thanks joe some good points there and i'll, I'll, I'll i'm going to answer them in reverse order ideally um i'm going to pick up on on, on how it's as well um 
we don't think ultimately this will cost us more for a couple of reasons. Um, we're certainly not in it to make savings. This is not why we went into this. We went into this to improve services because services were not what they could have been. And, and we've listened to what residents said about what they were like and, and want to improve them. Um, we will need more housing officers because in order to make this work, a housing officer will need to be responsible for a lot less properties than they are now. But what we have at the moment is housing officers responsible for something, um, caretakers responsible for some bits, antisocial behaviour officers, leasehold management officers. We've got people all over the place responsible for different bits. Um, so what we want to do is concentrate that in, in, in the one role and in local team roles so that that can be provided by, by those people. We think that will help us make savings. We think that there's something called failure demand, which means if we keep getting it wrong, um, we keep having to put it right, and that costs a lot. You know, the resident survey said to us, um, on average, it takes something like four phone calls, maybe, that are for a resident to, to sort out a complex repair, um, a non-standard repair. Imagine if we could do it in one. That's three times we didn't have to answer the phone and talk to a very disgruntled resident. That would save us some money. Um, that's what we need to try and do. And also, obviously, what we need to try and do is, is one, one of the things I want to say is what, about access is we want to provide the way, ways of access that anyone can use. So if people want to talk to us, they can talk to us. But we know that increasingly there will be a percentage of people who want to use digital channels. I'm not going to force anybody to do it, but they want to do that. And if we can make that cheaper and more effective, and you know the, the technology is getting better to be able to do that more effectively then again that will reduce some of the the the, the costs in terms of those high level transactions in terms of people so we think that we can provide this service at, without any significant increase in cost but primarily we're going to do what it does to get it right and to make sure that we are in this for the long term we want to do this for the long term um you know, very few times, I think, in the, in the history of, of the council, have we, we gone out and found 3,000 odd residents to tell us what matters and use that as a mandate. In terms of staff being absent, if you've got, if you know, if your housing officer is responsible for your service. Well, this was something that came up at a, a staff briefing I did yesterday as well. Um, two things. I mean, obviously, we're going to put people in local teams. So we're not going to leave people out. They're not going to go, you're a housing officer, right? Off you go there. Come back next year and tell us how you got on. Um, they're going to be work. With, they're going to be working. We expect them to be working with quite agile management, which means daily kind of check-ins with their team, etc., to look at what the workload is, um, so that they can deploy resources across that team as effectively as possibly and pick up on any difficulties straight away, including absence. Um, we're going to do effective workforce planning. It's amazing how many times organisations kind of don't do that. In a year, you would expect people to be off sick we know what we know what the average length of time people are off sick is we know that people go off on maternity leave we know that people sometimes have sabbaticals we know all of these things and workforce planning suggests if we plan for all those things to happen then we will have enough people to be able to put to be able to deliver services if we plan for everyone to be here all the time that ain't gonna <laughs> they're not you know and i would also like to think that you know it will be a more fulfilling job for people and a better job for people, they're very frustrated at the moment. People want to do a good job and find it really difficult because of the way we organise services. And I would like to think a more fulfilling job uh, where we effectively work with people and manage them and empower them and support them will lead to less sickness absence. That's great, Julian, thanks. So I'm going to take, I've got three hands up and I'm going to take, I've got four hands up. So I'm going to take three, three at a time. And so I've got Councillor Clough, Councillor Goggin and then Pete Daw. So, Councillor Clough? Um, hang on. Yes, I am off mute. Mine comes back to what Julian was saying. It, even in the short term, Julian, it would really help if, if there was more emphasis on people actually putting their out of offices on when they're sick and people being clear that there's somebody taking over. I have a specific offender in mind, but I keep having to go over her head to find out if she's disappeared again. Um, and that's a, that's the councillor using the internal system. It it really isn't fair on the residents or on anybody else when you can't when there's just no answer. 
when the phone rings and rings or the email goes into a bottomless pit. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. That drives me mad. That drives me absolutely insane. We are working. We are working on it as well. We've already. We've just instigated a standard signature for everyone in housing at the moment, and we're going to check up that they're using it soon. Which again, gives their name, gives their phone number, how to access them, and we would then expect them also to do a, to do a standard out of office message as well. But with with little steps at the moment, all right, but we're getting. With with, I, I share your frustration. I haven't had an answer from this individual over the entirety of lockdown. I assume she's one of the 9% who are not working. Yeah, but that does, that's not good enough. Ex please email me with the details. Okay, so that, that's another one to take offline by the sound of it, uh, as a specific instance. So I've now got four people. Can I take these four uh, together, Julian, and then respond to them as a group, if you can? So Councillor Goggin first. Hi Julian, yeah, just a quick one really. Um, it's more of an observation than anything else. I have noticed over the last 12 months or so a definite improvement in the response um, and reaction from housing staff. I, and I speak as a councillor dealing with um, queries from residents and also a, a council tenant of some long time myself. Uh, for example, I had, a, I had a, kit, a leak in my kitchen over uh, during the COVID and, and you know, that was all dealt with. Wonderfully well. Um, I mean, the only problems I generally get now are people complaining more about the number of houses we have. And obviously there's no magic wand. We're doing our best to try and build as many as we can and, and the, the home choice allocations and so forth. But I, I was just, yeah, offering a little bit of encouragement that um, although this is another improvement, I think you guys have already made a, a fair improvement already. Thank you. That's appreciated. Thank you. So, so Pete, Pete, door next, and then Philip. Um, lots of things to say. Sorry, Alex. Um, firstly, I'm going to go right the way back to 2003 and the wonderful phrase from Dame Kate Barker: "Outsiders and insiders." We're, we're relatively good at, at meeting the needs of the insiders who are current tenants of the service, and I appreciate the redesign of the service and the huge amount of effort going into it. But I do want to also remind and hope to capture the outsiders to the service currently, the people who are applicants to Home Choice Bristol who aren't yet housed, the people who are experiencing the sharp end of the housing crisis and are not yet receiving the service because we're gatekeeping it. You know, we, we've got so much demand and so little supply that there's, there's an entire generation out there who are just not being met by the landlord service. So that was the first point about outsiders and how are we capturing the needs and interests of the people who are applying for housing but aren't yet in it. Secondly, in terms of something when the councillor said earlier about um, uh, staff absences and, and I guess the word is burnout, um, as, as Alex knows, I, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Housing. I did my test of professional practice as the housing officer for St. Paul's for the then Night Zone Housing Association, what, what's now Live West. And, and I, I would say to Julian that Live West did this very well. They had a a rotor, a timetable for the week on which every resident could see via the internet the morning and the afternoon that their housing officer was going to be on duty at the front desk and they could drop in without an appointment. And when you have 80% of your tenants living within three minutes of the front door of the building, that's a very, very high turnover of footfall and a very, very high number of people you get to see face to face when you do that. And it was much cheaper and a much better experience for the tenants to just know the day of the week, one morning, one afternoon, that they could walk in without an appointment. I, I, I have Sue Rowlands as my housing officer. I've never met her. Never once have I managed to actually talk with her on the phone, because if I leave a message, it will be up to 21 days before the message is returned. And I can absolutely guarantee that she will use my home voicemail, not my mobile phone, even if I ask her to phone my mobile, just so that she can leave me a message and tick me off her list rather than actually meeting my needs. Now, that's not a personal attack on Sue. That's just a reflection of how the service is currently running. We're, we're not getting 
good contact and we're wasting huge amounts of time. The third thing I wanted to say is around the generic qualification of housing. Now, Professor Marsh knows that I was one of the last students of Professor Pete Malpass and had the honor of being one of his PhD students at one point. We were trained to a very high standard to get to that um, chartered membership of the CIH, and it included having a generic housing officer skill, the ability to not just deal with noise nuisance complaints, but to deal and act in person in court, to be in court every Monday afternoon, acting in person, taking the cases for evictions, getting the eviction orders, doing that work as well as the rent arrears, as well as the noise complaints. And I, I think something has been missed in the service designs to date that you inherited rather than designed, where we have somehow dumbed down the level of need, the level of training that is needed to be a housing officer. And we've narrowed the, the skill set so much that we've lost something about the role. And it would be really great to have that back, to have all of the contacts, whether it be antisocial behavior, whether it be rent arrears, whether it be acting in person in court and seeing face to face in the county court, the housing officer who served the physical notice of seeking possession, because only with that granularity and detail of knowledge of the lives of their tenants on a smaller size of patch, does it become first contact, getting it right, first time, and the housing officer having that knowledge of the uh, smaller number of people. 600 was a large patch for Knightstone and 300 for the St. Paul's in the city. And I, I would encourage you, if you could replicate that generic, smaller patch-based housing officer role, I think it would improve the customer experience of tenants like myself, Julian. Sorry to give you so much. People, so I'll just take Philip next, then Julian come back. So, Philip, did you want to say something at that point? If you don't mind, uh, three things, most of them personal to here. In more in the south of Bristol, at present, we have two wardens for 14 sites. You never see a warden ever. I don't know what the support is here. I mean, the Claire does a very good job, but she's in and out like a like a well, whatever you want to describe it as. Um, the other thing is our part-time housing office. Now, how can somebody work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and give a very good service? At the moment, we've got a new housing officer who uh, seems to be doing a good job when you can catch her, but I can't understand and I don't criticise her for it because she's only working part-time but she's, she's never available, or if she is, she's in and out, like a button, you know, gone. And the other thing I would like to say quickly, the last point, is if you really want to get local residents into joining in and telling you what they think, bring back the area housing committees. Because that was a brilliant system, it worked, once a month and it worked we knew exactly what the voids were we knew what the repairs were i was on barton hill and uh brislington and st george i think it was the largest area housing office the largest area housing committee in the, on the city but it worked and we got chucked out thank you okay. Thanks, Philip. So I've, can I just say, so I've got uh, Councillor Bolton and Kerry still waiting, but Julian, do you want to come back at that point? Um, yeah, I mean, I think those are all the, most of the points that have been made are valid points, and hopefully they're, they're, they're things that we're trying to address through this, through these changes and this transformation. Now, I know whether we go back and call things the same thing, or we do that one of, or, or we call them something different, or we do it slightly differently, one of the things we do want is good quality local resident involvement and local engagement with residents and the chance to listen to residents locally to keep them informed and for them to keep us informed. Like I said, we have lost, I think, because of the way we've designed services, some trust over the last few years and some relationships need to be rebuilt and that's what we need to do. So I think that's part of it. Um, 
Pete's absolutely right. You know, we do need a more professional housing officer role. And I think, you know, one of the things we're going to need to roll this out is smaller patch sizes and, you know, a, a type of training package that says these are the modules that you will need in order to become a housing officer. Now, whether we can do that in conjunction with a, with a formal qualification or not, we need to have those building blocks in place. Um, the other building block, also, I mean, I, it was, it's many years now since, well, nearly 30 years, I have to say, since I started my professional housing qualification, um, scarily, um, as, a, as a young in a London housing officer. Um, the one thing we never got taught in that course was, was good quality customer care skills and how to be nice to people, oddly. And it strikes me that that's going to be, have to be the heart, the values and the culture of, of good quality service and how to interact with people has got to be part of the heart of, of the role as well as those other essential modules as well. So, yeah, and in terms of, I'm just going to very quickly come back on the outsiders because it's the point that Pete made. We do, obviously, we've got a large development programme. We've got a pipeline of over a thousand new council homes at the moment. We've got a move on programme to tackle the, the, block, the bottlenecks that we have in terms of temporary accommodation and um, our homelessness pathways. And obviously the people we've had to put into emergency accommodation recently. So we're trying different ways to, to, to find literally hundreds and thousands of new homes that might not just be council homes, but to actually mean that, that there's a massive, massive increase in supply for those people who are at the moment outside of that settled housing system. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, students. So Councillor Bolton next, I think, and then Kerry. Right. Um, yeah, I was going to mention area housing committees because when I first got elected as a councillor in 2006, that's, I think that was my, my introduction to, to um, council tenants and my God, it was quite an introduction and the area I was involved was covered Bedminster, Southfield and parts of what's now Central and there was a sort of quite a local identity. So the areas we have now for the meetings we go to are just sort of like half of South Bristol. We sort of think, well, yeah, okay. Um, but I think back then, and you'd have the area committees, you, you, you'd have, thing, I think it was a tenants participation unit. I think, seem to remember them having budgets they could vote on and various things. And, and you'd get the views of the people locally, but it all must have come at a cost. There must have been a cost to service it all. So it just, I find it slightly, shall we say, I have my doubts that you can do it without making that sort of investment into it. And I would assume it was got rid of when it was got rid of probably about, 2010 or 29 that was financial reasons in the first place so so i probably just re repeating what I think, um when the councillor said which is i'll be fearful that you can do it and in my fear i mean the the um the report you present it's got all the right words in it in all the right order and it's, it's great in principle but it's it's how you're really going to make it happen and that'll be my buzzer and it, it just reminds me of things where somebody comes along and says all this stuff and it fizzles out a couple of months later. Um, that was it. Okay. So hold that thought for a moment, Julian and uh, Kerry, and then uh, I've got Councillor Sergeant again. Kerry? Um, I was just wondering how the allocation system fits into all of this. Um, obviously you've got home choice and also um, when you do an exchange from one council property to another or even to a housing association, property it all seems to take a long time um, back in the day when I became a um, council tenant at the age of 19 um, it was a points-based system um, now it's um, banding system um, I quite often get people contact me saying oh, I'm in the wrong wrong band how do I get put in the right band and it just it just seems really really complicated so if if this new housing service is um, more streamlined how does how does all that fit in Thanks, Kerry. That chimes with a question that's come through on the chat about the uh, review of home choice and what the state of play is with that. That's come through on the chat function. Um, Councillor Sargent. Um, yeah, sorry, it's just a comment about um, how you, ma um, you manage these very local teams in terms of their meeting their needs, because what I would be quite concerned about is if there is no housing office, and as my understanding is there isn't a plan to bring back bricks and mortar 
um, housing officers, we they need somewhere that they can be feel safe. And I think that to rely on them using um, blocks of flats or sheltered housing or anything like that wouldn't be appropriate. So um, I was kind of uh, sort of asking whether you'd had any conversations with the sort of community centres, stroke community hubs in various areas in terms of being able to arrange somewhere where they can go effectively for their comfort breaks and have sort of some sort of base because I think agile working is okay up to a point but actually if you want your um, housing office to feel like they've got a home patch and it really is their home in, in during their working day they also need to have a place that they can call home as a com you know as a, a place to be comfortable and I think Kerry has made the suggestion they could be based in libraries I think there are quite a few possibilities but what I would just suggest to, that you might want to be looking out for is if there are any any spots any areas where there isn't a suitable place what you might do then I just feel like you know I am quite concerned about the well-being of those people because historically they do seem to have struggled and I want us to be able to this everyone to be going forward together and they don't they I think they're only going to be able to do that if they feel they're truly have like somewhere and feel comfortable and feel like they are part of the community. Thank you for that. So Julian, there's lots there to, to chew on. What would you yeah. like to, to pick okay. up? Okay, I should try and I should try and get through them at, at some pace. Um in terms of in terms of Councillor Bolton and, and cost and, and this fizzling out, I am we can only be judged by how we implement this. Um, but we have obviously committed a significant amount of resource to this. We've brought in change consultants. We've set up a HR and OD team to, to, to deal with this. It is co-designed from, from colleagues, so it's not something that's top down. It's, it's designed by the people who deliver the service. So, you know, they will be asking the same questions and want to see this happen. So obviously you can only judge us on, on, the, finish, on the finished results, but I am confident this is something that we will be implementing over the next year and we'll be here for some time to come. Um, in terms of lettings, um, mutual exchanges, etc. Obviously, we were in the middle of a lettings um, review and a big review of our letting systems and policy, um, and whether we've got the right system to, to let properties in home choice or whether it needs refinement or replacing um, at the, when lockdown started. Purely because of the amount of demand that's been on our housing options service during during lockdown, we have not had the resources to continue that. So that's one we'll have to restart um, soon and complete. Um, and that hopefully will come up with, again, using the feedback we've had from across the city, something that might work more effectively. And I'm always in favour of something being the simplest it can possibly be um, in, terms of, in terms of navigating from A to B. We sometimes make things as more complicated than they need to be. Um, but that's a piece of work that's going to happen in parallel with this change programme. Um, in terms of location, um, I am obviously encouraging people to work um, to find places that other community buildings that they might want to be based in and, and work around. I have to say, I mean, I've, I've worked in the in the last ten years for two 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 very large London housing associations, and my teams um, there have been based. You know, could have been based. Some some regional teams were based at least 150 miles away from each other, and people in the same team were based that far away from each other. And, and having an office would have they could all meet in was a luxury it is possible to to work agilely and effectively remotely it is about how we exercise our duty of care to people and how we manage people how we motivate people how we check in it's really important when you are when you don't have a physical building that you can call home on a daily basis and obviously people will have temple street and hopefully other buildings across the city if you don't have home that you feel part of a team, you feel supported, you feel managed. So we, we must make sure that we have those systems, those daily check-ins with, with the whole team and with individuals that, that work. And actually it allows us to be much more responsive. If, if working that agile and working without an office requires you to be more responsive in terms of how you manage and support people, because otherwise it will fall over. And the last thing we want people to do is expose them to any form of danger or health and wellbeing issues. So that's key to the, how we design um, the rest of this and make that work effectively. So it will be a combination of buildings, but also really effective 
day-to-day -day agile management of how we of, of, of our teams. Thanks for that, Julian. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of time. Are there, I've got, I've got, um, Pete, you've got your hand up. Is that another, is that in, intentional? If you want to come back in? Ah, right, okay. Um, sorry, thank you. Okay. So, so, so um, in terms of um, feedback, Julian, you've had, you've had a bit of feedback there and some suggestions and some thoughts. I mean, is there a sort of standing invitation if, if people go away from this meeting and other things strike them to sort of feed that into the, to the process? Yeah, please. I mean, you can either contact me, you can contact Rob, who's in the meeting, Robert Swift, you can contact Liz. Um, any feedback you have about any of this, we'll, we'll listen to it, we'll take it on board. And if you've got any suggestions of how we can, we can either improve what we're doing, you want to get more involved in the design of the next phase of it, you, you want to suggest how we can get more residents um, to take part in it, please, do, please just let us know. Julian, I've, I, I've got a meeting with the Bristol Older People's Forum tomorrow because they've done a, a survey of older people on housing and one of their issues is about getting involved in, in service design. And there's also uh, coming to the end the survey that's been done of uh, BNME uh, housing needs. Um, and I, I wonder also whether it's worth talking to the, um, the youth parliament within bristol as well about you know in terms of getting that that range uh, of input but um I, I i think there are some people who are banging at the door to to be engaged and involved uh, yeah. so hopefully there will be quite a lot as well as well as the people within the local forums uh, there there will be quite a lot of engagement on this because um it's uh, i think it's such a crucial issue there's no there's no point us building loads and loads of housing as we intend to do and buying housing and developing our service if then our, the, the people don't benefit from it once they're in the homes. Um, so I, I'm really pleased uh, with the work that's been doing and uh, really encouraged by the report that you made earlier. Um, even if Charlie's word that it's just a load of words in the right order, at least, they're, at least the right. words are there mm -hmm. and they're in the order. I'll take that. Okay. Um, Pete, did you want to come in at that point, Pete? Um, yes, sorry, Alex, I do. Um, just a couple of things picking up on, on what Paul was saying there and what Julian said earlier about buy-in into the design of the service, going back to one of the outsider groups. We do have the youth parliament, so we have four Bristol youth MPs and uh, through the city office we have two youth mayors of the city and I would very much want and welcome them to be invited to have a special input into this as, as one of the groups who are not well served by the current service. I think if, you, if you're 50 plus and you want to move to an EPD in northwest Bristol you can do it almost the following week. If you're 18 and you're leaving a children's home and you want to establish an independent home in the city for the first time you're probably going to be in your 40s before you're even through the housing register and that 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 difference between the unequal treatment based upon the profile of our stock and the opportunities that that then gives through the housing register is something i would very much welcome the youth mps and the youth mayors to have their input to and wonder if we could do a special event uh, for them. They're certainly worth contacting and talking to about how they would want to get it involved in this. I think we've, we've taken that away. I noticed Rob writing it down. Okay, so I think probably at that, at that point it would be, I'm conscious of the time, we should probably draw that item to a close, but noting there's an open invitation to, to contribute for the thoughts and to, to get involved in, in future discussions. Um, so um, item eight on our agenda is the date of the next meeting. I don't know if Steve got thoughts on when we're, we're a little bit out of sort of our cycle now. So I don't know when, when our next- No, I'm not Steve aware of Sarah has got to work with the, uh, the tenancy team, I'm afraid on that one. Sarah? Okay, um, I think we'll be looking at making our next meeting in November. So we'll do um, some contact later and try and arrange a date with members. Okay. 
and 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 at this stage, it's hard to say whether that will be in this format or uh, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to sort of reconvene physically in the in the meeting. But we'll, we'll cross yeah, that bridge. Definitely a bit closer, too early closer. to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. To um, so, um, Councillor Sergeant has just put a hand up. Is that in relation to the next meet, next meeting date? Well, yeah, it was also about trying to um, <clears throat> to find out what's going to happen about replacing Richard um, as I believe he is the North um, the Area One representative, um, and um, I, the lack of attendance at tenants forums makes it I'm um, quite not sceptical. Well, quite concerned about how easy it's going to be to replace him. Um, and I do think, in the, as a general comment, we need to try and work harder to get a greater level of engagement from from tenants in the tenants forums, but also coming around to the, the the housing management board. I know that this has been talked about before, but I do think we've got an opportunity now with um, using Zoom or other um, conferencing software that may be available. And trying to get some of our tenants to engage that way so that they don't have to schlep to City Hall or wherever. I think we might get a bit more of attendance. There's been a lot of problems getting people to go along to tenants forums. So I think we're going to struggle to get a representative out of Area 1 if we don't look at other ways of engaging. And I think, you know, it's not ideal. And I know I've had problems with my connection tonight, but I do think doing it this way may be partly the solution anyway. Thank you. So yes, we intended to look at um, electing another representative at the meetings in September, but you're, you are right. We were planning to do some promotion of the fact that they will be run differently to see whether or not um, engaging with people online does bring um, more tenants to the meetings and greater representation. So it is an opportunity to see whether or not we can bring in more people to these meetings. So we will see whether or not we can get some results from that. Okay, no, I think that's an important point that, that people are represented appropriately. Um, so um, that just takes us to item nine, which is any other business. Now, if we were together, I'd go around the table, but I'll just say, does anybody need to raise their hand if they want to, if they've got an item of any other business? Uh, I'll uh, uh, Philip has raised an actual hand, so rather than a Zoom hand. So Philip first. Hang on. There we are. I'd just like to say that I'm very disappointed um, that there's, considering there's no travel involved, I'm very disappointed that the attendance of the reps that we have. And I'd also like to point out that the last meeting we were due to have, and I'm in Area 5, was supposed to be the date of the last meeting of the Housing Management Board, November the 19th, last year. Um, we've no idea where the when the next local housing forum meeting will be or where it will be. But one of the problems we have I live in Bedminster. The, the meeting could be in Brislington. Well, there is no link in public transport without going into the centre and out of the centre again. And, you know, I can understand residents not wanting to travel on the buses late at night because most of the tenants who attend meetings, and this is going back 22 years I've been, I think it's 22 years I've been a tenant, I'm now 72, um, 73, sorry, um, that most of the people are getting elderly. You know, they, they've, you don't see any, eight, I've never seen an 18 year old at a area housing committee when they were going. And I've never seen a 25, 30, 40 year old person at a local housing forum, but we've only had five of them. So maybe I'm wrong because I've only ever missed one. And um, so I just think, this plan, this local area forum needs to be addressed, needs to be looked at. Because I'm sure Brislington to Bedminster is not the only um, long distance travel involved in these very large areas. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so it seems to me there's a couple of things there, isn't there? There's a, 
there's a, a question about communication around dates and the possible clashing of dates or otherwise and how, how these things interrelate, I think was where we started there. And then there's the issue of within the areas travel or, or whether actually this pandemic period, it goes back to Sarah's point, opens up opens up op options for different different ways of communicating or getting people involved, which avoid some of these issues about access to public transport or travel at night or, 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 or what have we. So, so I think all those points seem to me to be entirely well, well made and to be reflected upon. Um, Councillor Sargent, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask um, whether there's an update to be had at all. And obviously, I know that things will have been delayed, but regarding looking at uh, piloting um, some broadband um, connection for some of the um, sheltered housing, um, I was at, uh, uh, that question, I think, is quite relevant particularly is what we've just said about trying to get more people to participate. You can't really expect people to put in, in to participate in, um, virtually if they don't have um, broadband. And there was some discussion about doing some sort of pilot and I don't know where it came from, but I was asking particularly in relation to Moorgrove House in my ward, but I'm sure there's quite a few other um, common um, council um, sort of you know sheltered housing blocks that would benefit from that and getting our tenants to be more and um, you know giving them an opportunity to be more IT literate and also to participate in meetings I know it won't solve the problem um, Philip, uh, that Philip mentioned about the youth <laughs> but it might at least mean that we get a decent attendance from people you know um, from sort of you know old residents Julian, is that within your? It is. I mean, I think there, there are two Obviously. things. One is, there are two. There are two bits. One is we 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 have a broadband pilot, which means obviously because any company that wants to provide broadband um, can come in and, and and install it. So one of the things we have is a pilot to make sure they don't come in and install it badly, like you know demolish things like fire compartmentation between floors and stuff. So we want to make sure that we have a, a policy that they they can work with. Um, I can't remember what we'd said we were doing on sheltered housing, so I will get um, Gillian Burden to um, get in touch with Joe, but also to send a note round to, to to members of this of this group just to update on what's happening with that because it's not. I'm afraid that's one of the things that's that's as, as I get older, it's it's left my head completely. Okay, thank you for that, June. Any other any other business at this stage? If not, our time together draws to a close. So I'd like to say thanks to everybody for their contributions. And I know these the, the one challenge with these Zoom meetings is they're quite tiring. So thank you for sticking with us for the period. And thanks to basically Julian batting uh, a range of questions around and in response to our comments and, and observations. So thanks for everybody. And um, I will hopefully see you all, uh, maybe as, as the observers observations made a few, a few more uh, next time uh, that we get together and somebody and I'm not sure it's me will uh, end the meeting so thank you very much everybody thank, thank you, you. bye everyone bye bye bye, bye. bye, -bye. oh